Today I want to take a look at a game between Luke van Bailey and Vasily Ivanchuk that was just played during the 10th round of the r tournament in Foros. So, van Bailey was white, Ivanchuk was playing black. Let's take off. It's quite an uncommon opening where Luke van Bailey plays e4 on the third move, maybe preparing to play a king's Indian with d2, d4. But Ivanchuk prevents that and he plays e7, e5. Lamavelli plays d4 anyway, and they're in exchange on d4. But we can see now, of course, that there is pressure on the long diagonal. This black bishop is placed very, very powerfully. Knight c3 was played, adding to the pressure of the knight here on d4, and bishop e3 was played. Now queen f6 was played, again adding to the pressure here of the knight on d4. And this knight can no longer be protected uh, uh, in a third way, so van Wely decides to exchange the knight here on c6. And uh, Ivanchuk now plays d c6, which is a very interesting capture. It is interesting uh, for strategical reasons, because this pawn structure here, it looks a lot like the uh, Ruby Lopez exchange. But in the Ruby Lopez exchange, White has exchanged his bishop here for the knight on c6. So now White has managed to exchange one set of light pieces, and without giving up his bishop here. And we can see that he also maintains the pawn majority here on the king side. So you would say, why is Ivanchuk uh, playing like this? And why doesn't he recapture with his b-pawn, for instance? Because now there is a clear pawn majority for white on the, on the king side. Well, I think the answer is that both the c4 pawn and the e4 pawn are vulnerable. And uh, I like to use the expression, they are sticking out like a sore thumb. Well, I wouldn't say they're sticking out like a sore thumb in this case, but they're at least sticking out a little bit. And this one here on c4 is also blocking in the way of the bishop. Of course the bishop can go to e2 or to d3, but it is limited in its mobility a little bit by this pawn here on c4. And uh, as we shall see in the remainder of the game, both pawns can be attacked quite easily by black, and black does not have a corresponding weakness. So I suppose that's why black can play d takes c6 here in these positions. Okay, let's follow the game. Knight c3 was played, and queen e7. Immediately that black is putting pressure to this pawn here, and uh, white already has to uh, reckon with bishop takes c3, after which this pawn could be lost. So bishop d3 was played to protect both pawns, and now knight f6 was played, again putting pressure on this pawn here, and also threatening to play knight g4, which would harass this bishop here on e3. Okay, now white could have played something like castles, but then we see that the idea with knight g4 is really quite good for black and it um, it certainly equalizes. Now white does not want to give up his bishop, so for instance bishop f4, and now knight e5 attacking these guys here. So now also c4 is a target. Well, let's assume bishop e2, bishop e6, yet adding some more pressure here to the pawn. Now the most natural defense would be b3 of course, but this move is probably not completely possible, because there would follow knight c4, unmasking the attack of the bishop against the knight, and after b takes c4, bishop c3, rook b1, b6, queen a4, counter-attacking this weakness. Ha! Finally, black also has a weakness. Castles, queen c6, the material balance has restored. But after a move like queen a3, I think I would prefer black, just because of the activity of his pieces and also the fact, of course, that his pawn structure is better. Okay, so that explains why after knight f6, uh, why did not allow the knight to go to g4, but he prevented that with h3. f3, by the way, would also have been a decent possibility. 
So now knight d7 was played. And Ivanchuk is keeping his options open. Does he want to play the knight to c5? Or does he want to play the knight to e5? In both cases, this block of white square pieces here will be under pressure. So now there are followed castles and castles, and queen c2. This protects, or overprotects, is maybe a better word, the pawn on e4. And it also connects both white rooks and anticipates black's next move. Black could have played here knight c5, and then after bishop e2 something like f5, which would lead to a very interesting game, but he played knight e5 in the game. So, now von Whaley uh, naturally moves his bishop back. He wants to uh, preserve his both bishops. And now Ivanju played a very interesting move. And I suppose your name has got to be Ivanju to play this kind of move, because I don't think I would play this move myself. At least it is not to my taste, not my style. Ivanju played here the amazing g6, g5. And of course it is not completely without logic, because he wants to play g4, and break up this pawn structure here around white's king. So in playing h2, h3, white has given black some kind of a target. But let's not forget that black is also creating a lot of targets in his own position by playing g6, g5. Uh, to mention one, the pawn on g5 itself, you know, or this complex of white squares. So a very interesting sharp move. A normal option would have been after bishop e2 just to play something like bishop e6 which would attack the pawn here on c4 and then after b3 eh, I don't suppose uh, much is going on. But that's not to Ivanchuk's taste. He played, let's go back to the game, g5. Okay. Um, now the solid positional player that Van Veli is, he he didn't see any real danger coming immediately, and I suppose he's right, and he just continued developing in a very sound way. He played here rook a d1. And I was thinking, if you want to fight a bunch of with your same weapons, then after g5, maybe f4 would have been a very interesting opportunity. Also immediately taking advantage of the fact that there is now a pawn break here in the position, and that you're attacking the knight, and that if the f-file gets opened up, white, uh, sorry, black will also have some weak squares here, you know. Anyway, um, that was not to Van Wely's liking, and uh, yeah, I suppose that has to do with his style also, of course. And apart from that, it might very well be that um, playing one of the rooks to d1 is simply the objective better move. So, this was played in the game. Now there followed bishop e6, attacking the pawn on c4 two times. And Van Bailey very solidly now protects the pawn with b3. And Ivanju continues his development with rook f e8. And I suppose that Van Bailey now plays an inaccuracy. It's not very easy to think of a plan here for white. One of the things that um, is really noticeable about, about the position is this knight here on c3. It has no easy way forward, you know, this square is taken, this square is taken, and of course he cannot go to e4 because he would be uh, on a square where it's one of his own pieces. Um, so he has got to play a very um, small plan. So, rook d2, with the idea maybe of doubling the rooks was a possibility, or also queen c1 was a possibility to, to add to the pressure on this pawn here on g5. And then, you know, black would be forced to kind of react, and moves like bishop f6 or h6, uh, they are really quite uh, passive. And of course, if uh, black were to now push his pawn, he also got to remember that this square here on g5 would then be accessible for the white pieces. So I think both rook d2 and queen c1 would have been better options. But he played, after rook f8, bishop h5. 
Now, of course, the square on h5 has become available for this bishop, but that does not necessarily mean that you have to go there with the bishop. Okay, it is attacking the pawn on f7, but there is no real threat here, and um, also this bishop is looking indirectly at the rook here on e8, but it's not quite clear if that will bring white anything. I suppose that maybe uh, Van Bailey's idea was to play here f3, you know, and play f3 only after he has brought his bishop out of the pawn chain. And then after f3, maybe he intended to bring back the bishop here on g4 and try for a very solid blockade and exchanging his bad light squared bishop in the process. But what he probably underestimated is that he's a little bit too late with this plan, even though nothing is lost. But black can now try for a small initiative, and he does so with g4. So now there is an exchange on g4, like this, and of course now the knight ends up on g4, and this has the very nasty threat of playing queen e5, double attacking the knight on c3, and of course much more seriously threatening mate here on h2. So there's only one move, but it's a decent move, and that is bishop f4. So this protects the e5 square, it protects the h2 square, and it protects the bishop itself. Well, multifunctional move, right? But Ivanchuk now continues, and uh, he plays bishop e5, you know, just adding to the pressure over these black squares. And at this moment, Van Weyli blunders. The right move to play would have been queen c1, you know, just protecting this bishop here, on f4, and nothing serious is happening really, because all these white squares, sorry, black squares here, they are sufficiently protected. And uh, if there were an exchange here on f4, uh, the white queen would recapture and centralize itself, and now very possibly this weakness here of the black squares could tell. So Ivanchuk would probably not play like that to exchange on f4, but maybe he would play something like rook a d8, and then the position would be equal. But after bishop e5, Van Weyli did not play queen c1. He played the actual losing move, queen e2. And we can understand the tactical idea at first sight. After all, when black takes this bishop now here, White will simply recapture the knight with check. And then black is forced to play something like queen g5. And after the exchange, and a move like, hmm, let's say f4, and bishop e7, and maybe even rook d7 here, coming to the seventh, white has an advantage. It's maybe not a big advantage, but we can see that there are three pawn islands here for black and only two pawn islands here for white. And um, yeah, white is also controlling the d-file, so certainly a small plus here, I think, for white. Okay, um, nice idea by Van Weyli, but of course after queen e2, Ivan Duke did not take on f4, no he brought another piece into the attack. And it's hard to believe that Van Weyli missed this move, you know, they play on such a high level. So let's just suppose that he saw this move coming also. Queen h4. Maybe Van Weyli missed the fact that now he cannot take on e5. Please note that black is now, after queen h4, indeed threatening to take the bishop here, because this guy here on g4 is of course protected by the knight. So, if Van Weyli would now play bishop e5, then there would simply follow rook e5. And all of a sudden, white is lacking protection on his black squares. Because what is he going to do against the mating threat here on h2? Nothing. The only thing he can do is to give up his queen, you know, with queen g4, but that's ridiculous, of course. So after queen h4, it probably sunk in with Van Weyli. And um, yeah, the final try he has is what he played in the game, queen f3. You know, this protects the bishop on f4. So if black would now 
take on f4, then of course white could recapture, and there is no mate on h2 because this square is protected. And uh, if black does not do that, then white can try to exchange himself and then play something maybe like queen h3, you know, trying to block the h file like that. But white, sorry, black has a very nasty move now and it wins on the spot after queen f3. You want to play the simple knight h2. Maybe that's what Van Lady missed, you know. Normally you want to put the queen there and mate, but putting a knight here and simultaneously attacking rook and queen is also fine, of course. So the final moves of the game were queen g3 check. Uh, sorry, sorry, not the final moves of the game. After knight h2, look from where he resigned because of queen g3 check, exchanging. Now exchanging on g3, ruining white's pawn structure, and in the process winning the exchange on f1. But after a move like rook a d8, it is clear that white is going to lose this end game. Okay, so that ends our discussion of this game. So also on the top level, uh, sometimes uh, quite serious mistakes are made. I hope you've enjoyed it and learned from it. Please keep protecting your black squares. And uh, until next time, bye.